Welcome to Story Talks, where we discuss the practices that engage, motivate, develop, retain, and attract people to businesses. We'll give you principles and tools based on real-world stories to leverage listening and storytelling to become a better leader and management professional. Story Talks is produced by Narrative, a company that focuses on personal storytelling for business. Welcome to Story Talks. In this podcast, Julian Ryan and I, Jerome DeRoy, discuss ways in which we can create more engagement in our lives and especially at work. There are now more people who identify as disengaged at work than there are who mm -hmm. say they feel engaged. So we come from Narrative, which is a company that focuses on engaging businesses and their audiences through the power of listening and storytelling. And we employ a, a seven-step method to do so. And there are many people out there who work to increase engagement in a variety of ways and who use storytelling in a variety of ways with different kinds of perspectives and different angles. And we want to hear from them so that we can give you, our listeners, the benefit of their wisdom. And so today we have such a guest, really excited to welcome Zev Shalev, who's the CEO of another company that's called Narrative, spelled exactly the same way. His is Narrative Studios and Cool Wolf Inc., uh, Zev is a, is a former CBS News executive producer, uh, and he's been known to craft innovative programming and cover the biggest news stories of our time. Um, and he's going to tell us more about how he's continued that uh, in his current work. And I'm really just excited to, to welcome you to the show, Zev. Hi. Hi, Jerome. Thank you very much for having me here. Appreciate oh, it. You're, you're, you're so welcome. And hi, Jules. It's it's nice hi to there. see you. Hi there. <laughs> and have hi, you. Jules. I know that, uh, Jules, uh, you you, you uh, made this connection between uh, the two narrative companies, and we just couldn't pass up the opportunity to, uh, to meet. And especially when we learned, Zev, uh, what your background is and, and where you come from. And, and uh, you know, that's that a, a similar perspective in a way of bringing up voices that perhaps aren't always heard. Uh, but I'd love to hear from you to get us started here in terms of your own background and journey and what, what brought you to, to, to this kind of work. Well, thank you for that question. Um, I'll keep it as brief as I can. You know, the, the, the thing which, I, which drives me every day and the thing that I go for when I wake up in the morning, the, the mission I have or the intention I have is, is to find the truth and to tell the truth. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very simple you know, intention. And for me, it's, it's clarifying every day because it's just... You don't have to worry about all the politics and everything else around <laughs> around your life. You just have to worry around, you know, are you actually getting at the truth? Now, the truth is a tricky thing, as you know. It could mean lots of, you know, there is no ultimate truth. There's no complete truth. There's people have different truths and experiences of different things, and so you have to allow for some variation in what the truth is. But there is, you know, a set of facts that we all sort of agree on most of the time. Um, when we're not in the midst of a, you know, attack on, on our democracy, mm. we are most heavily have agreed on what the truth looks like. Um, so that to me is what I, I go for every day. I mean, that's, a, that's my mission in the day, every day. But, you know, I, currently I host a podcast, which is called Narrative Live. Um, mm. And that podcast came out of a blog that I started in 2016. I'd left traditional news television behind me. Um, I'd gotten really frustrated by the lack of ability to cover what was really going on and the amount of constraints that they had on our reporting, the corporatization of, of the news media that we just, I just had had enough. Um, so I thought, well, I'll practice my long form writing. I'll start a blog. Um, and I, there was this thing going on about Trump and, and was he a Russian or asset or not? And it was just before the elections. And I thought, well, I'll start writing my blog about that. And I previously registered the name Narrative, N-A-R-A-T-I-V, as you spell your name, um, as your company. Um, and I loved that name. I registered it as a domain. I hadn't really figured out what the intention, what I'd, what I'd land up using it for. And as I was starting to write the blog and I found the topic of Trump Russia, I thought, well, I'll use that name, narrative.org. Mm -hmm. As, as the name of the blog. And, you know, it, one thing led to another. It became a really interesting exercise. It became an exercise in crowdsourcing because unlike all other news media, I was on Twitter a lot of the time, um, gathering information from other people on Twitter, sometimes soccer moms, sometimes activists, sometimes lawyers, sometimes intelligence analysts. So, you know, sometimes friendly and sometimes not friendly intelligence analysts. You know, they'd be feeding us different aspects of the story. 
And my job really was to try and pull all these things together in a, uh, in a coherent narrative um, that would read like a book that, you know, chapter by chapter would come out every week or every month, depending on how often uh, I found the stories. And we would slowly tell the story of our time in real time and tell the book, you know, in, a, in book form. So it would be easy for people to understand. That became a podcast. And, uh, and that's where we are today. Mm. Not to be telling you much about my history, but it's at least telling you how I got to to narrative.org and how I got to the, the podcast itself. Oh, we'll, we'll get to that. We'll get to your backstory in a few minutes. Good. But it's terrific. And I appreciate it because when I rediscovered you, we knew of the name and I thought, this is timing. How can I not have two narrative come together and model what we preach about being curious about what informs our story and what connects us and find out the roots and the backstory. So I'm glad I... Uh, Took the chance and reached yeah. out to you. So I, I'm you. so glad you did too, by the way, because I, I'd been encountering your name on Twitter where a lot of people had been either at tweeting you, intending it for me, or the other way around. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I must be causing these people a real nightmare because you had the name in the marketplace first. And I felt really bad about it, tried to figure out how do I, how do I reorient the name, but it was a little too late to change the domain. And I, I couldn't have any any other real correct, um, any other thing that would have as much traction. I landed up coming up with a bit of a solution for, for Twitter. We landed up with actually narrative TV, but it's, you know, I, I apologize really for being on your turf uh, in, that, in those early days. And I'm glad uh, we can finally have this resolution of our mind, these of our minds and our story. And then I was like, how can we not be talking to each other? Yeah. This is like in New York, we, we practice what we preach, get curious and take a chance even, and it works. All righty, so over to you, Jerome. <laughs> well, I, I'm really <laughs> interested in uh, in that idea of crowdsourcing, you know, for for and how you sort of pulled the threads of a story together from multiple uh, sources in that way. Which I mean, I guess you know, I'm describing journalism, but there is something kind of interested in ter- interesting in terms of these very what I'm imagining are very diverse perspectives. Um, you know, some rooted. Uh, as you were saying, like intelligence analysis, whereas another is a soccer mom, or how, how did you kind of go about making sense of all of it? Like, do you, how do you approach that kind of, um, and, and maybe before that, how did that even seem like a, like a method to you uh, in terms yeah. of doing it that way? You know, um, I didn't really think about it because uh-huh. it was just there. So I just started using it. Um, and then uh-huh. later on, I realized crowdsourcing was the name I should apply to it. And um, you know, it just made sense. As it turns out, people on Twitter were all sharing a lot of information. A lot of people who care about America were just in deep crisis, um, mm-hmm. trying to figure out, you know, what's going on. Is you know, is, is America's future actually something that they could believe in? Especially um, soccer moms. I mean, there was, soccer moms inspired me the most because mm-hmm. they really were up all night long, still being soccer moms during the day, still helping the kids and the families do whatever they needed to do, but then worrying so much about the state of their of their country that they needed to stay up all night long to, to devote tons of attention to minute threads. And it was really interesting how each of them organized themselves in, in, into different threads, into different areas of interest. They collaborated with each other, but each had their own sort of personal um, you know, uh, expertise that they were looking into. And that was very useful because, to, you know, to get that in a normal newsroom, you can dedicate so many journalists each to, to these narrow niche little uh, trunks, tra- tranches of, of, it, of knowledge. And yet here you had people voluntarily doing it on a re- on, by themselves in great depth and, and gaining a lot of knowledge. So for me, it was an incredible resource. If I needed to check something, I could check with one of them and say, you know, did, you know, Manafort meet with so-and-so on and pants on this date. And they'd be able to figure that out for me I mean, very quick, very quickly. So they also were needing a place to, for all this to be collected. And that's where the blog sort of became, that's what the blog became is a place yeah. of record for all their, uh, all their hard work. Mm. Well, you know, I, I love it. Cause one of the things that, that we often think about in our work uh, and try to, uh, or have to go against in some, in some sense is, uh, is what we call the dominant narrative, you know? So mm-hmm. there's there's one narrative about um, a topic that has sort of taken over. And as a result, all these different, more sort of localized stories are are either not told or, they, or they've just kind of disappeared, you know? And, and you can apply this, you know, to marginalized populations, for example, you know, and, and that sort of thing and, and uh, the origins of, of our of our work uh, were during the uh, 
HIV and AIDS uh, crisis, um, at which time, you know, the dominant narrative was uh, that this was an illness that only hit a particular population, you know, mm-hmm. and, and, and that no uh, medication existed and that, you know, you were, it was a death sentence, essentially. But it, it sort of erased all these more localized stories, which were just simply about the human beings uh, behind the illness. You know, it, suddenly there was a label, and if you were gay, well, that was it. You, you know, you you were the person who were who was most at risk. You know, and that's sort of how you were labeled. And so a lot of the work at the beginning was getting these stories out that weren't just about the label of HIV/AIDS or weren't just about the the sexuality label. Uh, but rather about, you know, who am I as a human being and how can I relate to everyone else so that everyone else starts to care about this because it's actually a community issue and not not just a localized issue. And so, um, you know, the reason I bring that up is is in, in, in that sort of, uh, uh, you know, the way that you created this blog is kind of interesting to me because it, it's sort of a similar perspective of like, let's get as many uh, perspectives as we can, and maybe not the most obvious ones, um, mm. you know, and then and then your job, it sounds like, is to sort of put that together in a narrative form. Yeah, I mean, I love that you bring up the uh, AIDS uh, crisis, because I was, I grew up as a gay man in that crisis, and I know that, you know, there was a, a school of knowledge and, and rules we were told to do, mm. and I know, sorry, and I also know that, um, those rules were not what landed up being the most accurate reflection of what you should have done or, or could have done. Um, in fact, they were more, far more restrictive. Um, and, you know, I've had a very healthy distrust of authority for a very long time. Um, growing up in South Africa was, a, you know, a really education, it was a real education in what a state media can do to people. And, uh, mm. and, you know, I didn't believe a thing that came out of the state media in South Africa. So I grew up in a, in a world where I had to distrust all the information I was getting. Um, and so that's actually quite a useful tool to have in life, um, mm. you know, because when it did come to, um, you know, moving to North America and the AIDS crisis and, and, and then finding myself in the middle of the story of, of covering, you know, Barack Obama and then Donald Trump, those two things are very, um, you know, that lack of that distrust of information was very, very helpful in everything I've reported. Um, because you don't off, you know, the, in, in, invariably the dominant narrative, as you call it, is, is not the correct one. It's one that they want you to believe. Um, and, you know, you have to really dig around to see if, what the real truth is behind that. And that can sometimes be crowdsourcing. I mean, one of the best things that we discovered is there were all sorts of people feeding us narratives um, that were incorrect. Um, and in fact, there was just a lawsuit around the Durham uh, case, uh, the Durham uh, um, uh, John Durham, who's the uh, special counsel, just had a, a case involving just that kind of information, false information being leaked into the ecosystem in order to change the narrative. Um, and, you know, we, uh, we had to figure it out. We had to figure out what was true and what wasn't true. And in some cases, we had to say, well, this is what they're saying, but there's all these other facts that are either proving it or disproving it. And, uh, and that, without the crowdsourcing, without that, you know, there must have been hundreds, maybe thousands of people involved in sharing information on these, in these little niche interest groups that we were able to figure out, you know, in general, what the truth was around, around Trump Russia. Mm-hmm. So fact checking is something, you know, we, we grew up thinking that was part of journalism is you have your opinions, but you go back and you research yeah. it and you, you curate, I know it sounds naive, but it's like, but no, it's, it's, <laughs> it's true. It's, it was the aspirational goal of being critical thinking, I think, weighed in and looking at more than one voice and one more than one resource and gathering your news. So, and yeah. one of the things I like about the narrative method when I learned it and, and started to work with Jerome is it shows accountability. And we use personal narratives when we go into organizations, something historical, something personal, but you own the I and you own the why mm-hmm. and the context. And that's what builds trust. You might not agree and everything you've heard when you get into um, tougher topics, but you at least you have a reference point and that person's holding themselves accountable. And then I'd like to hear more about how you weigh in on what's fact or fiction and yeah. incur trust with people, what you're gonna do with the information when you've gathered it. Well, I'm an old school journalist. So I learned in my first journalism jobs that if you had two sources, independent sources telling you the same thing, that was a fact. Um, 
I still believe that actually. I still believe that's a very good mm. a description of, of, you know, a way to finding out what a fact is, but it's not what is currently used in newsrooms. In fact, right now, most newsrooms will only choose information that comes from a, a trusted source, which they would include mostly government uh, type institutions or people working within government institu institutions as trusted sources. They don't necessarily go down this road of let's get two independent sources in, um, agreeing with each other, and then you've got a fact. Um, that is a, a real mistake, in my opinion. You know, we've, we have become, without knowing it, a nation that really relies entirely on you know, the Department of Justice, the FBI, um, and other groups to tell us what's going on. And I can tell you firsthand that they don't know as much as those crowdsourced moms that I was talking to, because they just don't have the resources and they're not built in that way. You know, there's just institutions run like institutions. They're designed to run like institutions. They'll have human intelligence sources, you know, all around the world covering, you know, spying on specific things. But they never check the open source, almost rarely, uh, wow. you know, very rarely would they actually go and check the open source. And the truth is all out there in the open source, actually, turns out, if you just, um, if you just spend the time researching it and, and cross-referencing it. So, you know, um, those are the two things I'd say, you know, double check, see if you can get two independent sources to say th that happened and make sure that they're truly independent of each other. Obviously, more than two is better. But the other is to go to the open source and just see there are so many facts out there that you can, you know, uh, it's so easy to take a bunch of facts by different reports, uh, different uh, organizations or, or reporters and, and see how they line up. And either, either they do line up, it becomes pretty obvious that it's a true story, or it's just, it's just, it's a lie. And, and the lies, the lies start screaming at you when you, when you get used to this kind of process of just trying to identify what's true and what's not true. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I want to go back to, uh, we're, we're always interested Whenever we have guests on on the podcast, um, and you've alluded this to to uh, you alluded, alluded to this a little bit, um, but I'd love to go back to that. It is you know you mentioned that growing up in South Africa really kind of shaped your view of things, especially because state media was you know the the I mean that was the dominant narrative, right, and the, mm. and the false narrative, um, and, and I wonder. What what would you say has kind of shaped your view of how to approach journalism? Uh, because I'm like I wonder do do you know if you ask a, a a kid or a teenager what do you want to do when you're older? I don't know that a lot of people would say journalist. And I wonder mm -hmm. I wonder how you how you got to such a point in your life where you were, you know you were sort of like yes this is the this is my interest, and uh, what was the what was the gen genesis of that? You know, um, the, the, it, it started early because my mom used to place a radio in my cot when oh. we moved from uh, from Israel to South Africa because uh, she didn't know much English, and I guess it was a way for me to learn English. So I was listening mm. to um, to the South African radio news <laughs> as a as a way of growing up, being indoctrinated by it. But um, but I, you know, I think it is a sense of. Um, you know, it's, it became so, you know, if you're a decent person and you grow up in South Africa, there's a point where your naivety just sort of has to be stripped away or you're lying to yourself. Mm. And at that point, you know, I, was, I guess I was entering my, my rebellious teenage years and I was like, there's something wrong. You know, this, this, the story we've been told is not, is not reality. I mean, clearly this person working in my house as a domestic worker is not an equal of, of everybody else's. There's a different situation with all these maids and staff and servants and, and why can't they live in nice houses and why can't they live in up the street and you know and all these simple questions that you start asking and why can't we walk you know earlier on as we were kids she would take me for walks and i couldn't sit on the bar and she couldn't sit on the park bench with me because it would say you know for for whites only or uh, or no non-whites and so it was just you know you couldn't help but look around that society if you're an honest critical person and say things are all right here this is not you know it's it's um it just wasn't, and and that sense of them not having um, the same because I really loved them. I, 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 you know, as a kid, you don't know the difference between, mm. you know, you just you know, just friends with your with the son of your maid or your, you know, that's your maid. It's it's, it's your nanny. It's everything. She, she looks after you. She does everything for you. So um, that's you know, it's just like loving your mom. And so you have the sense of, um, of, of real questioning about why they can't have the same safety or the same security or the same things that you have um and even if you wanted them to have it they couldn't have it because the rules were just not like that um and so that's really what i would 
what drove it. And, you know, there's just a sense of there's something wrong with the system. And then it was just around the time as apartheid was ending that this, this was, a, you know, they were starting to let some of the truth come out about what was going on. And uh, as a teenager um, it, at school, I was like 16 or something when Mandela was, um, was released from prison. And, uh, and I had, you know, some very re rebellious friends uh, who were just, you know, a little on the left-leaning side of this other political spectrum there. And we, we signed um, these, uh, we, had, we signed these forged documents to get us get out of school early <laughs> that day. <laughs> Hitchhiked into Soweto to go and see uh, the arrival of Nelson Mandela. Um, which you know was probably really stupid, but um, also <laughs> also really a thrill of a lifetime. Um, and it was remarkable getting there. You know, it was remarkable. I'd, I'd never been to Soweto actually in that at that point, and um, I'd been to other townships, but not Soweto. And we would drive up in these minivans, were full of you know packed with people. Um, and when we got there, it was just this teeming crowd of like thousands and thousands of people had arrived to see Mandela. I'm gonna have to find the tissue. Hang on a second. Not because I'm crying, just because I need a tissue. Um, <laughs> yeah. so give me a second. Oh, all right, no sure, worries. That's fine. No worries. Um, no, let me just. I'll just. I'll just. I'll just go. It's fine. I'll finish this. Um, so, so the teaming crowd. Yeah, yeah, teaming crowds. So, so we walk up to the stadium, and it's very. It starts to feel a little weird. I mean, we're wearing school uniforms from our private Jewish day school in South Africa, you know, and these, there's, it's a pretty uh, celebratory mood. With lots of people screaming and yelling. There's all the chants, you know, the Viva Mandela, the, all these kinds of things going on. People are uh, singing. There's a real jovial atmosphere. And, and we couldn't really get anywhere inside the stadium. It was so jam packed with people that we just sort of thought, well, what are we going to do to stand outside here? And then as we were trying to figure out what to do, we heard a voice from above um, and uh, we were between these two stands where the um, where this crowd was sitting and there was these these brick buildings in between each of the each of these stands and and there were people on top of this of this brick building and uh, they called up to me and they were like come come up come, come up here come up here so they pulled us up somehow i don't know people came from around us lifted us up we it was like 20 feet in the sky next thing we know we're on the top of this the roof structure or this uh, brick structure in between these two um these two uh, stadium seating seats areas and they pushed us right to the front right to the very front and because wow. for them it was just as important that uh we as white south africans were there to celebrate the arrival of nelson mandela as it was for every almost all the other black people there it was just so important mm -hmm. for us to be there and um and it was incredible. I mean, now we had a front row seat, basically, and we could see everything. We could see Mandela arriving. And, and uh, I'll never meet this guy again. I don't know, who, don't know who he was. There was this guy who helped me up with the first, the first uh, when I first arrived there. And he stood behind me and translated absolutely everything to me for the full three hours we were there. So not only did I have, like, you know, this incredible seat, I also had someone who was opening up this whole world of, of dialogue and... Um, an explanation around what the stories were, about the poetry that was being read, about the meaning of all the stuff that was going on. That was truly, uh, truly remarkable. I mean, I was just felt so blessed to have had that, that experience. And then, you know, Mandela is like, um, was, he, he was, they are very, I, there's no one I've met actually like Mandela, maybe mm -hmm. a couple of other people come close, but he had to have a soul that beams out from, from within them well before they arrive, you know, that you can feel their presence no matter where, where he, whenever, whenever I didn't cross paths with him or meet, or meet him, it was always just in very different, um, it was always just, just sense his goodness and his presence walked into the room before, before he did. And, mm -hmm. uh, and this was a person we'd all been told to hate, you know, this is the person we'd all be told to, was a terrorist and was going to destroy South Africa and was going to ruin all over everything, but turned out to be one of those inspiring, sweetest, uh, loving, uh, principal person you'd ever want to meet and we would ever want to to rule a country like South Africa at a time of transition. So it was, it was best wow. to have that experience. Yeah. Wow. I, what, what an amazing story. Yeah. Go ahead, Jules. I don't know where that I came from, by the way, that just came out of nowhere. So. And that's beautiful. <laughs> well, two things I was thinking, first of all, maybe with this broadcast, that'd be yeah. amazing if that person who was your story guy <laughs> uh, that day yeah. hears it or sees your tweet about it. Um, but it's that whole act of not just witnessing a story or a change, but having somebody to stand by you and and help you understand why it's impactful in meaning. I think that was right. There is no um, 
that was an amazing moment. And also mm. the, the chance of that happening, the right person at the right time being there. Yeah. To, the poetry to, was, to recognize the poetry. that. So interesting yes. to, to add to your point, it's a, you know, the poetry is very uh, descriptive and it's, it would hard, be hard for me to access any other way. First, it was a different language, but to understand mm -hmm. what, it, what they were trying to get at, because, um, you know, African poetry by its very nature and storytelling is very, it's all about animals and it's all about mm. beings and spirituality in a way that we don't, I would never have connected with. Um, right. and, and he was able to, to you know, um, translate that for me and also explain it to me along the way, which mm. was so helpful because it could sound kind of threatening otherwise you know the the the, the, the way african languages can sound can be sound can sound kind of threatening but then in this in all this case it was actually being a lot of you know good meaning innocent kind of spiritual yeah, yeah. spiritual poetry that was going on it's like a true a true interpreter right yes. not just the mm -hmm. language but also what's the interpretation of the language and yes and, uh, that's really good best way to understand it wow uh, amazing, and just those images. I mean, thank you for sharing that because I know that I'll 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 not soon forget that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, just the 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 magic of it all and, and those details. Uh, really amazing. Um, well, I would imagine, and I can you know I can really see because that was my question was you know a moment that shaped um, sort of you know how you you came to 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 be a journalist and what brought you there. And it's it's amazing to me how every time we ask this question not just on this podcast, but anywhere. If I, if I ask someone about a moment that shaped who they are, you really get a story I mean, and you get something that's pretty, it, it feels to me like everyone has a specific moment like that, or maybe, you know, many moments over one's life. Uh, but, you know, it, clearly I can, I can make the connection from that moment when you were 16 to who you are now, just based on the few minutes we've, we've, uh, we've spent together. It's amazing how much that can inform um, you know, the, the, how you see someone or, or who they are. And it's, and it kind of adds layers, uh, to who you are for me. So thanks, thanks for, for sharing mm -hmm. that. Uh, so how do you go from, you know, that experience when you were 16 and then obviously going through the kind of traditional route of a journalist and then, you know, this, this blog and podcast, which is, you know, non-traditional, I would call it, but still using those, uh, sort of old school journalism techniques as you were as you were talking about w what is how do you sort of see your field evolving and and like what are the stories that you're interested in in bringing to light um you know we talked about the 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 trump russia uh, you know of 2016 but i'm curious what how you're seeing things now because there's i mean you know there's so much going on um and 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 i wonder for someone like you where your attention is is going? Where do you set your yeah. sights? You know, I, uh, I landed up working at a radio station in South Africa called Radio 702, um, which is the only independent radio station in South Africa that um, that existed at the time. Everything else was state owned. Uh, and uh, I got to cover Mandela's uh, election to the presidency of, oh, of America. So I was of South Africa. So I, um, I got a full piece of that story arc, which I, uh, mm. uh, and that's that's about how I was able to meet him at a later stage. But there was a, a, a full sense in me that day. I think maybe it came from before that. That you know, in a world where you had so much change, the only way you were going to be able to get through that change is by communicating effectively with each other. And uh, and we was there was just you know everything about South Africa was set up to be a giant mess it was going to be a conflict and it was going to be at war and there was nothing good was going to come out of it and yet you knew the people didn't want that and you knew there was such great love amongst the people of the land and against and of each other that there was a way through this if they would just start communicating and um and this radio station was was started off as a music station then became a talk radio station and we spent the last four years before we became uh president um talking about all these things having full and frank conversations on on the radio station 24 hours a day, seven days a week about what you know, race meant and how South Africa was evolving about corruption, about all those things. And we became, um, you know, one of the reasons I think that apartheid was, end, was able to end so successfully um, was because of that, of that radio station and that dialogue and that ability to have that dialogue. And of course, you know, people like Mandela willing to participate in and, and lead that dialogue was so important. So to, to, to answer your question around what it is that I'm doing, it's the same thing. I mean, I just don't feel like it's like I feel like it's exactly the same story. 
in fact, there's so many commonalities around the end of South Africa and what's going on in the attack on democracy in, uh, and on the, the attack on America that's going on since 2016, that uh, it's almost like reading the same script. It, it's very, very similar. The forces mm -hmm. are actually quite similar. Um, and so you've got, you know, you've got the race issues, you've got uh, these external forces that are hard to see and predict, you've got these, um, you know, seemingly uh, natural disasters like the pandemic and other things, which may not be um, these wars, there's all sorts of things that go on that helped South Africa reach this point of change. Some of it in order to steal a lot of the resources out of South Africa, some of it, you know, with the very nefarious intentions. Um, and it's very similar to what, uh, what America is going through right now. You know, I, having spent way too much time learning about this, I just feel like this is a, we're at a point where there's a multilateral um, attack happening on, on, on our country. And it's very serious. Um, and it's not just the GOP. It's the GOP plus a lot of people and a lot of, of power and forces around the world attacking us. Um, and, and yet I still, still feel as, as optimistic about getting out of this situation as I was about South Africa getting out of apartheid successfully mm -hmm. because it's the same basic principles apply. You know, the people's will is so powerful, and there's no matter how powerful all these other forces around us are, if we're able to communicate and if we're able to get to the truth, and I think that the truth is the hardest part to get to, um, they can be disarmed really easily because all they have is their lies and all they have is their is their you know their their pretense at force, but really they don't have real control over the people. Um, and if the people get to know the truth and they can unite around the truth, that solves almost all, all the challenges we'll have. It's not that difficult, but it, we need to get there and we're not there yet. So it's yeah. a little bit of a process. And that's a great introduction to the other part we talked, you and I spoke of when we were on our phone call together, because you brought up something uh, Jerome and I already knew about is at the end of apartheid they were using the art of storytelling and conversations and dialogue in the villages. That's something I read in numerous book and talked to people firsthand. So I'd, I'd love to hear your perspective. Were you able to witness that some of those dialogues that were going yeah. on time? Because that is not a solution, but it's a process that could lead to healing and learning and much more trust and appreciation. I think that people listening to each other is so important and we just have lost the art of listening to each other. And I mean this on every side of the political spectrum. It's so difficult to, even for, you know, people who a few years ago would have been quite open to hearing the other side's point of view. Uh, they just don't want to listen anymore. And it's true for the right. It's true for the left. I see it all the time. If I put to anyone on my podcast that my audience feels is, is, is it questionable or they don't like, or, did something when, you know, 10 years ago, then they're immediately meant to be like banned people. They're not meant to exist. Mm -hmm. This is not the right way for a democracy to survive and thrive. We need to have conversations with each other. Um, I mean, to understand each other's stories. I mean, you know, the, the rights have a certain story that they're trying to tell us about their desire to continue, uh, you know, being a, a dominant part of the American demographic. And, and they're trying to say that in as many different ways as they can. It's a legitimate point of view. We can't just say, hey, that isn't true because you're being racist. Mm -hmm. um, we don't want to hear anything from you guys. That's not the solution either. Um, and, and the left have a legitimate story to say that there's been so much um, you know, crime and corruption and inequality that we're not li really living up to, to who we should be as a nation. I mean, that's all legitimate um, points of view that we need to be listening to. And the way to understand that is to understand it through story. And in South Africa, the, the thing that drove me was this, the, the songs. I mean, there's the, the thing in South Africa, that a lot of the, the story of, the, of Black South Africans was handed down through traditional storytelling and generation to generation and songs. So, you know, especially in, in apartheid, where so much was banned. Any writing that would be anti-apartheid would be immediately banned. So what was done was all these... Uh, is hints at certain things. Um, so like the international anthem in Kosti Sikileli Africa uh, was a real call from Africa to, to, for peace and equality that, um, that, I don't know, it became so meaningful to all of, you guys should listen to it. It's just a beautiful anthem. Mm. Um, it's just, it's, it's, it's came such a beautiful call for everyone to bring to peace and justice that, um, and it was embedded in all these other things. You know, the, there was like these pop musicians or, political pop musicians that would embed little verses of that in their pop songs just to subvert the, the, mm -hmm. the, the, uh, the censors. And so, you know, the, it, the creativity of humanity to get beyond all the restrictions we have in terms of communicating with each other, 
I think is great. And I think that uh, hum, human beings will, ultimately human beings have a, a tendency to want to like each other and listen to each other and, and survive mm -hmm. and succeed together. We're communal beings. And, uh, and I think that wins at the end of the day, regardless of mm. what we're up against. Mm. I like I, the word you used a little earlier was optimism to mm. find moments to present optimism. You mentioned soccer moms. I mean, yeah. they're raising children. The act of children having children is an act of optimism. And I doubt it is. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I would have. <laughs> <laughs> but it is about finding a connection and meaning and yeah. community. Yeah. Look, yeah. we are in very dark times. This is not that we are as dark as it could be right now. And I, and I thought we were dark two years ago. Mm. Uh, you know, things have not gotten much better. I and mean, we have a fantastic leadership. We have fantastic presidents who's doing amazing, remarkable work, even though most people don't want to acknowledge that. But the, the odds are really tough. And what he's stacked up against him, really tough. But we have, at the core of who Americans are, is a is a beautiful thing. You know, we are truly uh, inspirational people who've managed to uh, arrange ourselves around an ideal, uh, which is just a beautiful ideal. And, and we've been able to live up to its promise through enormous amounts of innovation and, and confidence and desire to succeed and desire to lead the world to those things that we hold so dear, you know, liberty, equality, and justice. And these are the things we want. These are the things that we are. And so there's no other country on earth like that. This is only mm -hmm. the only country we have on earth that is true democracy. And it's arranged around these beautiful notions. Uh, and so we have to live up to them. We couldn't possibly leave this earth, uh, you know, leave, to leave this earth without handing the, the next generation the same promise. I mean, it yeah. would just be a disaster if we did that. You know, I think that's what holds America together through the most difficult times. And I think it's what will hold America through this time. But it does require people to sort of wake up and be involved. I don't think this is the kind of thing you let just you know drive. You can drive by and hope it fixes itself. Every yeah. American needs to find ways to making sure that that promise is handed down to the next generation. It's not one of those things that will happen unless we're all taking part in it. Mm. Mm -hmm. Wow, what a what a, a beautiful way to uh, conclude this conversation for now, uh, because <laughs> I, I really want to keep in touch and and. Um, and stay connected because I, I think the the work that you're doing, you know, this sort of truth finding work, is uh, is really important. And you're doing a lot of listening um, that perhaps others aren't doing, or many others aren't doing. And and I think it's really a, th those kind those are that's where the stories come from, the ones that we all need to need to tell and need to hear. Um, so so thanks for all the work that you're doing um, and and for sharing some of that with us. Uh, I wonder if there's anything that you would like our listeners uh, to do or think about uh, as a result of, of listening to this conversation? Mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, I know we have your, your website, narrative.org, but are there other places that, uh, that you want to uh, sort of guide our, our listeners to? Yeah, I mean, the podcast is the best place to sort of to check in. It airs live on Twitter on a Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday at 7 p.m. So it's a live right. show and then gets edited so it's a podcast it's like a tv show it's got video in it which is ah. um you know extra challenging for me sometimes and it's fun to watch me make mistakes um uh, but you know <laughs> the podcast gets cleaned up and it's edited and it's available wherever you get your podcast um right. and yeah i i would just encourage people to to do that one thing that there's there is one thing you can do every single day to mm -hmm. you know move the agenda that you believe in forward and, and make sure america does uh, fulfill its promise. And it sounds hokey and it sounds like, you know, Pollyanna-ish, but truthfully, it is a remarkable place we live. And we are very, very, very lucky to have uh, a USA, no matter where you live in the world, you're very mm -hmm. lucky to have America. Um, and so, you know, it's up to us to keep it and we should mm -hmm. let it go. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Beautiful. Really, th thank you so much again for, for being on this podcast. And uh, yes, we will share in the, in the notes, all of those links and, uh, Really wonderful to to meet you and to get to talk to you and thank you for your for your stories and um, you know willingness to come on our show. I really really appreciate it. Thank you both. I really appreciate your time and I was sorry I didn't get to learn more about the narrative uh, ink method, but I'm going to learn more about it because it sounds it sounds truly uh, we innovative will, and we'll and make right. it happen. Okay, great. I really, really find it fascinating. No problem. It's, uh, it's great stuff you guys are doing. So thank you very much for having me on the show, Julianne and Jerome. Thank you. Yeah, okay. of course. Uh, well. Bye. 
listeners that uh, that concludes our our show um thanks again to to julian ryan uh for co-hosting with me and uh, and for setting this whole uh, interview up and uh, and thanks zev of course for being on this show if uh, you all want to learn more uh we will post those links um the podcast is the is the best place to go to uh to it, it's three times a week on twitter uh, you can go and check that out, but of course it's also edited and you can find that uh, wherever you find your podcasts. We'll have all those details in the show notes uh, with, when this episode comes out. And if you want to learn more about what we're doing at, at Narrative at the moment, you can go to nartiv.com and check out our blog posts. We've got a, a few different um, things going on there as well as Story Talks, this podcast where you can go back and revisit older episodes. Uh, we're now starting to get a nice uh, library. And if you or your organization want to learn more about what we do in the leadership development field, sales field, team building, and onboarding, please don't hesitate to get in touch with us. You can email me at jerome at narrative.com, N-A-R-A-T-I-V.com. And we're always here to listen. All right, on that note, thank you everyone. And we will see you next time. Bye. Narrative Story Talks. For more information on the narrative listening and storytelling method and how it can help your business, go to narrative.com.